fifth, we call them now EAA Financial Reporting Standards Workshop. So this is a virtual workshop co-organized with uh, the ISB, the FS and FRAC. And it's, it's very, very attractive, inclusive for me. And uh, this is going to be on the post-implementation review of IFRS 10, 11, and 12, the consolidation package. Um, again, our regular uh, Zoom etiquette, I would like uh, for you, I would like to ask you to mute yourselves um, until we have the Q&A sessions where you can then, uh, where, you, where you can then, of course, ask questions. I would like to ask you to place your questions into the chat and indicate whether you want to speak up or just uh, preface your questions by um, chat only, and then we can uh, just consider them without um, without um, offering you to speak. Uh, Anna Simpson from the ISB will be um, posting her email address into the chat, and she's happy to receive any follow-up questions or comments or uh, useful information, uh, pertinent literature through the chat from you. And I think that that should work fine. So again, this is number five in our series of these EA financial reporting standards workshops. Um, and this one uh, will discuss um, these topics in the context of the post implementation review, which is, of course, uh, one of the most important points in time where academics can really speak to a standard setting issue and really bring evidence to the table that might help hopefully the ISB to revise the standards in a way that makes them more decision useful. Uh, there are more of these workshops to come and let me maybe quickly share my screen with you here to uh, tell you a little bit about what those are and um, let's see so you should see now my browser with this EAA logo and the website of the EA so under events here we have a list of the EA events this keeps getting longer and longer so we have the annual Congress, of course, and the other events we've had for years, but now we have a suite of virtual of online events, including this one, the EA Financial Reporting Standards Workshops, and the list that you see here includes today's one, but it also includes a history of the previous ones, where we have recordings uh, and uh, reports about them, and we also have a series of upcoming ones that you can already mark in your calendars and already get registered and get more information on them. So I think this is a, a very nice set of workshops uh, for both, you know, for both involved parties, the EA and the members and its members and also the standard centers. Um, we have about 120 registered participants, about half of them are currently in the call. And uh, we're really looking forward to a lively discussion that will generate again, hopefully, useful input to the post implementation review, but also hopefully generate valuable insights for your teaching and for your research, including research ideas. So let me briefly introduce. Um, Sorry, Justin, you're sharing your outlook. Oh, I'm not sharing my outlook. I shouldn't do that. Okay, good. So let me stop that. Thank you. Let me uh, introduce uh, the participants or the active um, uh, the active uh, participants here in this call today. And Tarka is going to represent the ISB board. We have Filippo Poli, who is on the technical staff of the ISB and in charge of this post implementation review. And then we have an academic colleague who will be providing academic views and insights on this consolidation topic. This is Niklas Hellmann. Niklas is an associate professor at the Stockholm School of Economics. Department of Accounting is also the acting holder of the Handelsbanken chair in accounting, and he's a member of FRAG's academic panel. Niklas was also a member of the Swedish Accounting Standards Board during 2008 to 2016 and was its vice chairman actually for five years from 2011 to 2016. I should also mention that Niklas is the past chairman of the EAA's Financial Reporting Standards Committee, a committee that has as its mission to accompany the ISBs and FRAC standard setting activities and bring academic evidence to the table. And that committee is currently chaired by Anne Jorasim, who is also in the call today. In terms of the format, uh, we're going to have an overview of the ISB's request for information for this post implementation review first, and then a summary of academic literature by, uh, by uh, um, the ISB 
staff and also then a commentary by uh, Niklas Hellmann for each of these sections uh, that this request for information contains. And after each of these sections, we will open up for questions and your feedback before moving on to the next one. And again, feel free to post your questions into the chat. I'll be monitoring it. And if you want to speak up, I'd be happy to call upon you to unmute yourself. But if you just like to comment, please preface your comments by the word chat, by the words chat only. Good. Let me now hand over to you, Anne, to introduce the objective of the peer and um, lead us into the topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thorsten. And I'd like to thank Thorsten Baha and other people at the EAA for welcoming us once again to be part of this webinar. We really appreciate the opportunity to be speaking to so many members of the European Accounting Association located in so many countries throughout the world. So we do appreciate this. I must join with Thorsten in saying that PIRs, the post-implementation reviews, are a great opportunity for academics to be part of the standard setting uh, activities. Um, the PIR, as you can see on the screen now, it is part of the formal due process of the IASB. And a post-implementation review is carried out for a new IFRS standard or a major amendment. Now it has to be um, implemented at least two years. And in the standards we are looking at today, uh, the implementation period has been longer. Uh, and so the idea of the post-implementation review is for the board to examine whether the standard is working as intended. So we now have a lot of materials, the standard itself, but also the basis of conclusions and other materials that do give stakeholders an idea of the board's process and thinking. Um, so we do have material that helps uh, all of us understand the board's approach and what it was wanting to achieve. So the post-implementation review is about seeing whether those standard setting objectives have been achieved. In terms of the outcomes that come from a post-implementation review, there's a number of things that, that may occur. So it could be that a standard setting project has been added to the agenda. The, the post-implementation review may indicate that there are particular matters that could be addressed um, because the standard, setter, the standard was not working as expected. Um, there could be research activity coming out of the post-implementation review which is exactly what has happened uh, in the case of the Goodwill project. And in one of our previous webinars, we've discussed the uh, disclosure, the discussion paper um, on uh, Goodwill and associated disclosures. Or, or the board may indeed decide that no action is necessary as a result of the post-implementation review. But a key part of this process is evidence. And that's where the academics come in, in terms of being able to provide academic evidence. Um, so that's all from me. I'm going to hand over to Robert in a moment, um, but uh, then later on we'll continue with our exploration. Um, Filippo will kick off for us. He'll be joined by um, Jen Shu from our technical staff and Anna Simpson um, giving us an academic perspective. So I'd like to hand over now to Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And I, I need to apologize for not introducing Robert properly. I actually, before this call, I asked about the pronunciation of his name. And I learned that it's Stoyek. So Robert Stoyek from EFREC, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I think the most appropriate slide would be slide eight, uh, where we can see EFREC's process. Uh, I would just to, uh, like to explain that uh, I, I lead uh, the PIR process, uh, process project uh, uh, in, in EFRAC and uh, our uh, aim is to collect European uh, views on whether uh, IFRS 10, 11, 12 work well and what could go uh, better. Uh, we also collect information about all the uh, consolidation package. So uh, if there is anything that uh, relates to consolidation and uh, we collect that information, so we'll be also happy to uh, convey that message to, uh, to the ISB. Uh, so the, the, the process in EFRAC is to collect information. We do not form a position. We form a feedback statement. We form a, a collective views of uh, 
uh, all the constituents and we have already had uh, a number of meetings with uh, our groups uh, including uh, CFSS, EFRACTEC, Board, FIWG, Financial Instruments Working Group and Insurers. Uh, we al already had uh, a user panel but we're still uh, seeking uh, uh, users' views uh, and uh, in April we'll have another user panel uh, meeting uh, uh, to collect more information on on uh, on eventual uh, uh, issues that should be raised uh, in in our reply to uh, to the ISB's request for information. The most important element now for us is our survey uh, that we have launched uh, uh, some time ago uh, in January uh, 21. And uh, we seek comments uh, of uh, users, preparer, auditors uh, uh, about uh, uh, implementation issues uh, regarding a consolidation package. Uh, then after uh, completing, uh, uh, after finalizing the service, we also seek some uh, interviews. We hope to have more interviews, more uh, webinars uh, in April. Soon uh, there is an ASCG webinar coming which we hope uh, to, uh, to collect uh, information about the uh, consolidation package to be uh, further, uh, forwarded to the ISB. Uh, one, one more element, uh, of course, we listen to all the comments, but we focus on European issues. So uh, our voice would be, as I say, a, a collection of European comments regarding implementation, regarding usage of uh, IFRS 10, IFRS 11 and IFRS 12. Thank you. All right, thank you, Robert. And I think we can now launch into the first part on IFRS 10. And um, I'd like to welcome Filippo Poli, technical staff member of the ISP, to start with this part. Thanks, Filippo. Thank you, Thorsten, and good morning, everybody. So the first standard we're looking at in this post-implementation review of IFRS 10, which treats about the consolidated financial statements. And uh, the cornerstone of this standard is the assessment of control. So if we move to the next slide, what I first then uh, uh, aimed to do was to introduce a single control assess assessment, which could uh, consider a wide range of structure that we can find around the world. And so it's very important that the definition and the guidance that is given in the standard to assess control works. So the definition of control has three elements. So an investor controls an investee when it has the power to direct the relevant activity, when uh, it is exposed uh, to variable returns from its involvement with the investee, and when it has the ability to affect these returns through its power over the investee. And in general terms, I would say that the feedback we've received is uh, support for this notion of control as the cornerstone for consolidation. Uh, we have received uh, questions to clarify certain aspects of the guidance. And you can see we have a number of questions which uh, relates, for instance, to identifying what are the relevant activities of an investee, especially when different parties have power over different activities, uh, how to assess whether certain rights that are given to third parties are merely protective or provide those other parties with power, uh, how to assess certain agency relationship, in particular when there is no contract uh, uh, underlying those agency relationship. In general, I would say these are questions about the application of certain aspects of the guidance. But if we move to the next slide, I think this is an interesting question for, uh, for academics, is that what I first 10 did was basically to move to control assessment that is holistic, based on all facts and circumstances. And compared to what we had in the past, uh, I would say is less reliant on the investor having 50% of the voting rights plus one. And uh, I think there is a prior research that showed that uh, entities tended to cluster their uh, um, shareholdings in other entity around 50% uh, or around 20%. 
And so for us, it would be really interesting to see whether the introduction, after the introduction of IFRS 10, there is evidence that this, uh, I would say, let's call it kind of strategic investment clustered around a certain uh, a quantitative threshold, like 50% or 20% for associate has changed. So I would say this is really the first question that we would really be interested in hearing from, especially from academics. Another aspect uh, of our um, post-implementation review of IFRS 10 is about investment entity. I understand as a general principle that when an investor controls an investee, the investor should consolidate this investee, which means showing line by line assets, liabilities, income and expenses. But we have introduced an exception for investment entities. Investment entities are those entities, let's say that uh, have a, a make investment in subsidiaries mostly for capital appreciation or to obtain dividend income. And we have defined, we've provided a, a definition of investment entity and certain typical characteristic that an investment entity should have. And in general, what we've heard is that there is support to identify a group of entities for which Consolidation is not required because investment entity do not consolidate their investment in subsidiaries, but they carry them at fair value to profit or loss. But the comments we have heard is that uh, the identification of investment entities is sometimes difficult. And interestingly, we have received comments, I would say they're a little bit on the opposite side. Some people told us that the criteria may be a little bit restrictive and they may exclude some entities that in their view should be able to qualify as investment entity and carry their investment at fair value. And we heard the opposite comment that the criteria may be a little bit too loose and allow entities almost to make a choice. So if we move to the, sorry, if we move to the next slide, there is an additional aspect about this discussion investment entity. Uh, because some people are saying that while they support uh, the fact that investment entities should carry their investment to profit or loss, uh, they believe that in certain structures, like the one described in the slide, there is a loss of information. In, in, in this case, when you have an investment entity at the top of the group, and then you have an intermediate investment entity, if you look at the financial statements at the investment entity parent level, you will only see the fair value of the investment entity intermediate. And some people say, well, now in this case, uh, the investment entity parent should show the uh, fair value of the operating subsidiaries. So they should not, they should not fair value the in intermediate uh, investment entity, but they should go see through and fair value the investment in the operating subsidiary. And so, when we hear this kind of comment, I mean, the kind of questions we want to ask is, uh, okay, there seems to be uh, support and agreement that there is a group of entities for which uh, consolidating subsidiaries does not provide the most relevant information. And the most relevant information is uh, providing fair value to profit or loss. And the question you can see on the next slide, uh, yeah, so I would say, what, what is the group of entity for which fair value provides relevant information? Because there is a wide range of structure around the world, venture capital organization, investment funds, sovereign funds. And the question is, uh, does the definition and the characteristics that we have identified allow to identify those structures for which uh, using fair value is more relevant than consolidation. So again, if there was any kind of evidence research about uh, when is fair value more relevant, what are the characteristics of uh, companies that make fair value more relevant than consolidation that would help us understand if the claims about uh, or the need to improve uh, the definition and the criteria for investment entities are uh, are are well grounded or not. 
I would say we have a number of other questions, but probably these two aspects are the one we wanted to draw your attention during this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Filippo. I would now like to hand over to Anna to introduce um, the academic evidence on these, uh, on these topics. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Thorsten. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Anna Simpson, and uh, I'm from the ISP technical staff. I'm uh, going to do a summary of uh, the academic literature review, what we've come across, uh, and uh, afterwards, Nicholas Hellman is going to continue with an academic commentary. Um, like I've said before in uh, previous uh, workshops of uh, this, um, Type. Um, if you if you happen to uh, work on something that is related to the topics discussed today, or know of a reference that will be relevant to the topics, please send it to us, and I'm going to provide my email in the chat room. Um, it's a Simpson at ifrs.org. So to start with uh, the academic evidence on IFRS 10. Um, I would say there isn't uh, much evidence, but uh, um, what we have is um, evidence from some descriptive uh, studies uh, that do exploratory type of research. And this evidence is uh, quite useful. And um, there is um, um, empirical evidence for uh, a couple of studies, uh, but um, what, what, are the, what does the descriptive evidence tell us? Uh, there is a study that looks at uh, whether the implementation of IFRS 10 has resulted in uh, significant changes in uh, the assessment of um, control. Um, and um, specifically, they show that uh, the application of IFRS 10 has resulted in um, some companies uh, changing the number of subsidiaries and uh, the direction is not very clear because some entities have consolidated uh, a larger number of subsidiaries where, whereas others have consolidated a smaller number of uh, subsidiaries as a result of uh, applying IFRS 10. There is another study which uh, looks uh, at a fairly large uh, European sample, and they look at whether the application of IFRS 10 has a significant impact on uh, the amounts in the financial statements and particularly assets, liabilities, profit or loss. And uh, how they do that, they uh, look at the restated data of companies uh, that uh, have a applied uh, IFRS 10 and also at companies' um, disclosures of whether they think the effect of uh, IFRS 10 was material or uh, also companies' disclosures of the monetary effects uh, of the transition. And uh, they do this for IFRS 10 and 11. Um, for IFRS 10, they, uh, they conclude that there isn't uh, much uh, 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 there are no um, significant changes on the amounts in the financial statements of the companies uh, applying IFRS 10. So uh, that's the um, sort of descriptive evidence we have at the moment. Um, there is evidence from an empirical study, um, which I'm not uh, by Bugea at all. And uh, I, I will not uh, dwell on this uh, at this point because Nicholas, uh, this paper has been uh, recently, uh, recently published and um, uh, slightly changed. So Nicholas is going to cover this. So stop here and hand over to Robert. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, I think my message would echo what uh, Filippo has already said, but uh, uh, maybe the most important elements of, uh, of the uh, topics we've heard from our constituents uh, is that uh, uh, IFRS 10 uh, seems to work well. Uh, however, there are issues that could work better. And one of the elements is assessment of control. Uh, 
uh, explained by Filippo. Uh, we, we see that there are issues, we hear that there are issues in determining some uh, specific aspects, for example, which rights are protective. Uh, this this uh, specifically concerns uh, long uh, acquisition projects, uh, where it's, it's not really clear what will uh, arrive at, at the end of the process, and then uh, which rights are protective, uh, which are not, and uh, which are just the rights of the future uh, uh, owner of the, of the entity of the subsidiary is not really clear. Uh, similarly, the power of uh, of uh, over an investee in de facto control seems to to create issues and uh, uh, would, uh, uh, would 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 need some more guidance, uh, particularly when the ownership changes from uh, well yes to no when uh, when the status of the entity uh, uh, changes. Uh, then uh, we recently heard that uh, it would be good to have a, a say a more thorough definition of returns because it's not like the it's not only the profits that are uh, uh, sold, but uh, uh, some other elements would uh, uh, would uh, affect whether the entity uh, controls the returns. And then on investment entities, I, I think has already mentioned uh, that uh, Filippo has already mentioned, but uh, I, I would add that element of uh, lost uh, information on financing and leverage. Uh, of course, uh, every entity should uh, uh, should. Uh, uh, includes, uh, should disclose all the information that is uh, necessary to understand the structure of the group. Nevertheless, it seems that in some cases, fair valuation is a, is a good method uh, not to present all the information about, uh, about uh, investment entities. And uh, practical guidance. Uh, we also heard recently that uh, accounting for cross ownerships in group uh, with some financial investment, for example, investing for future pension funds, etc., uh, creates issues, uh, practical issues, how to do it. And uh, it was a, a general comment that IFRS then on the conceptual level is uh, well structured, but uh, on the practical element, how to do those things, uh, uh, maybe would uh, would need some more more uh, examples, uh, practical examples, uh, specifically for smaller entities, not only for for the big groups. Uh, uh, this practical guidance would also uh, involve elements of how to consolidate different type of investments in one particular subsidiary or one particular investee. On the next slide, uh, the first comment uh, comes uh, more from the uh, PFS, Primary Financial Statements Project, but it it has been uh, mentioned that non-integral subsidiaries could be an element uh, to be introduced in RFRS 10, uh, could uh, at least could be discussed where such non-integral subsidiaries, uh, if any, uh, would, need, uh, not, would not need to be consolidated, uh, actually. Uh, then uh, a general comment uh, uh, that IFRS 10 would need a more thorough, more clear uh, uh, overarching uh, principle of what is the reason for uh, consolidated financial statements for preparation of financial statements. Uh, in, in opinion of our constituents, it would be, uh, it would solve uh, a number of uh, those technical uh, problems, uh, application problems. Uh, and finally, uh, recently heard from a, uh, in, in a different meeting, but it uh, seems to be also relevant. Uh, it seems to be challenging to provide the proof that nobody requested presenting consolidated financial statements, which is needed uh, not to produce consolidated financial statements in subgroups. Of course, there are also uh, local jurisdictions, local uh, uh, law uh, that uh, guides whether consolidated statements should or should not be presented, but in general, the general concept uh, could, uh, could create uh, uh, some issues on, 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 on uh, on the boundaries between uh, IFRS preparation of IFRS financial statements and the and, and law. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Um, okay, so Niklas, if you would like to talk about the academic insights that came to your attention on, on these matters, it'd be great. Yes, uh, I, I, since I have animations, I would prefer to use my PowerPoint file instead of the PDF. Is that okay if I share a screen? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this works. It works, right? Mm -hmm. 
So I'm very happy to have been invited to give uh, some some comments, uh, academic commentary. Uh, and uh, it, for this uh, project, uh, as Anna was describing, there has already already been a review of the academic literature, and that is also part of the of the documentation uh, here. So so that has already happened, so to speak. Uh, so when I started uh, then looking in uh, to this, preparing for this uh, event, uh, of course, what if this issue of consolidation and the scope of consolidation uh, is a, a classic issue, uh, it's something that uh, we have uh, considered for a long time. And Filippo mentioned there is a, a, a lot of companies around 50%. Um, because uh, it matters so much whether you consolidate or not, right? It has such a great effect on the numbers. Uh, and uh, already in connection here with uh, uh, the adoption of IFRS 10, uh, the, the background, so to speak, was that uh, uh, we have had issues with this in the past, most recently the, the global financial crisis, where we saw that there could be uh, companies uh, under uh, the control, Lehman Brothers were mentioned, even though that was not by for us, um, that uh, there could be uh, companies under control, even if you didn't own any shares at all, and things like that. So there was a need for, for a more principle-based approach, and to avoid that you could leave out, for example, loss-making firms. Um, and uh, then there is, of course, a longer history around that. We all remember Enron, of course, and the special purpose entities uh, where they managed to keep uh, a lot of liabilities uh, off balance by, by not consolidating. Uh, we uh, have also in uh, many other uh, countries, of course, uh, there have been issues regarding this. In Sweden, we all often refer to Mr. Ibar Kryger, uh, who had uh, the idea in the late 1920s and early 30s uh, to have different dates for the various uh, companies in his empire. And then he sold the assets uh, more and more expensively around the group, so to speak. And since no group accounting was prepared, uh, you couldn't really see the full picture. And that's why we got group accounting legislation rather early in, in my country. So this is... Uh, of course, an important background here. The scope of consolidation is important um, to um, avoid uh, that companies do not fully consolidate. And this is also what I interpreted uh, very much uh, when, when reading IFRS 10 for the first time. This was my perception. Uh, I don't know, I, I guess uh, some of you have done what I have done, namely teaching uh, cases using IFRS 10. And then you realize that the standard, when you read it, I'm sorry to say it, but it's, it's a little bit wordy. Yeah, it's, it's a, there's a lot of, of instead of, of uh, you know, giving very straightforward, it's not to the, the 50, more than 50% of the votes, right, as we were referring to, but it's, it's, it's trying to capture all these circumstances that would underlie whether this is really under our control or not. Um, and then you might say that it, this, it's principle based in this, uh, in a way that should prevent companies from not consolidating entities that they control and, and to be really uh, not leaving out any, any such company. Uh, and uh, given the, the, the purpose of the, of the post implementation review, is it working as intended <laughs> to, to be a little bit uh, bold there, you might say, yeah, well, it, I guess it would be successful as long as we don't observe any new Enrons or uh, examples like during the, the, the global financial crisis and so on, right? Because that's the whole idea, uh, I would say, that uh, we, we want to avoid, uh, given that this, um, uh, the consolidation has uh, so big uh, impact on the numbers. Having said that, I also think that it's worth noting, though, uh, that uh, uh, it's principles based and it's it's uh, uh, it's, it's a qualitative 
in its approach for these different dimensions. Uh, I think it might be worth noting there that uh, Chris Noakes, who I think is um, uh, also here in the in the workshop today, um, he published a paper some years ago. I think it was in 2014 in, in, in AAAJ regarding the scope of consolidation, comparing different countries here. Uh, and uh, maybe Chris will comment on this uh, himself later on here. But uh, the, the, there are cultural differences here. There are uh, the, the words uh, in IFRS 10. There is potential, of course, that this is interpreted uh, somewhat differently depending on the on the uh, specific country or or region or so. So having said that. Uh, then let's uh, think about the, the research here uh, that has looked into this. Uh, and Anna mentioned this, uh, this paper uh, by Bedford, Bulgaria and, and Ma, uh, that uh, a working paper from them was included in the, in the review of academic literature. Uh, now the paper itself was published two days ago. <clears throat> so that's quite timely, I guess, for this workshop. Uh, and uh, they have made uh, an empirical study here of Australian firms looking at the impact of IFRS 10 on consolidated financial reporting. And uh, they first consider the implications of IFRS 10 on consolidation practices and find that IFRS 10 adoption resulted in firms reporting significantly fewer subsidies. Uh, with this result concentrated in the first year of adoption. And, and furthermore, when they looked deeper into this, uh, to look at uh, the incidence of non-majority consolidation, if you, we remember the, the old kind of uh, mechanic uh, rule of having more than 50% than of the votes, what about those uh, firms that, where there is a, a non-majority uh, at 50% or below, they find evidence uh, of a decrease in the consolidation of non-majority owned subsidies after IFRS adoption. And uh, given the background here that at least my expectation was that we would actually see more consolidation uh, here, more uh, consolidation rather than less uh, with the, the, the principle based standard here. Uh, so I think that's a bit uh, surprising uh, in that in that sense, right? The expectation, I guess, would be to, to see more, more consolidation. Uh, then the authors here go further uh, and then look into uh, the consequences of the changes in consolidation practices. And first, they look into uh, uh, the issue here with the consolidation of uh, loss-making subsidiaries here. Uh, well, they look at the profitability effects, prof profitability effects uh, for firms reporting an increase in the subsidiaries. Uh, and uh, they see no effect. So it doesn't seem like those companies are uh, consolidating more loss-making firms as one might expect them given the, the expectation there from, from uh, EY around the adoption event. Uh, and then when they look also more into the numbers here, they see that the, the value relevance of equity go up, uh, but not uh, the relevance of, of, of income here, and the value relevance. Uh, and then when partitioning the firms based on the directional change in subsidiaries, we document a significant decline in the value relevance of net income after IFRS 10 for firms which uh, consolidate fewer subsidies here. Uh, so I guess this one can think about the interpretation uh, or there uh, different types of preparers here, uh, those that uh, do as intended with the standard that leads to more increase in, in uh, subsidies being uh, consolidated uh, and then there is this other group then who is uh, uh, having fewer subsidiaries where it becomes less value relevant. Uh, the net income is there some uh, uh, earnings management or account 
some type of, of, of manipulation here going, going on. But when you start to think a little bit more carefully about that, I mean, there could be many reasons why you would have uh, uh, a change in the number of subsidiaries with restructuring and, and so on. I guess it's fair to say that these results are, are somewhat difficult to interpret. Uh, it's uh, uh, not to me, at least, it, it's, it's not a, a very straightforward conclusion. So I was uh, thinking a little bit further about this, and I think what I'm missing here in, in kind of the, the research design, this is not the, I mean, it's a big effort, of course, to, to, to do this study and, and to report it, but, but one thing that I would have wished for, and I think uh, uh, th th there is a need for more research here to, to, to get the grip of this. The, the IFRS 10 is part of a package, right? That's the whole idea here is that it's a package of standards. The different standards are related. Uh, and just to give you an idea, this is a company I know rather well. It's a listed company uh, in the, the forestry and hygiene business. It's a global uh, company. Uh, and this is their annual report from 2014. Uh, and uh, let's have a look at some changes that they show here. So they have a reclassification this year. Well, they, they do this retrospectively, application of the, of the package, so to speak, here. And then they say, uh, because of the change here, we had reclassifications from subsidiaries to joint ventures. So what used to be a subsidiary is now instead classified as a joint venture, IFRS 10 and IFRS 11. We have a reclassification from joint ventures to associates, right? So um, do we have a joint venture or do we have a, an associated company? Is it joint control or is it um, significant control? And we have reclassification from associates to subsidiaries. So what we thought was significant control is actually control, right? This is perhaps what we, what we expected to see a lot of. And then at the top here, you can see that they would also look into joint ventures here, where they used to use the proportional consolidation method. And now they have realized that they do have, when they do an analysis of the shareholder agreements, they come to the conclusion that they actually have controlling influence there uh, in a number of those, those cases. Uh, it might seem strange. Uh, don't they know about their shareholder agreement, whether they have joint control or not? It seems rather surprising. Uh, but I think from a research um, perspective here, uh, if one only looks at IFRS 10 per se and to see if you have more or less subsidiaries as in the paper we, we discussed, one has to remember that this, there's also the other side. If we get fewer subsidiary, what do we get instead? Do we get a, a joint arrangement or do we get a, an associate? And if it's a joint arrangement, is it a joint venture or a joint operation? Uh, so uh, I think it would be useful to re for research here uh, to, to take a firm by firm uh, and look not only at the, the change in the subsidiaries, but at kind of both sides of this, because uh, uh, there, there will, there will, if it's not a subsidiary, it would be something else. And, and that uh, I think would be, to, to understand how companies deal with this, I think it would be a good idea to, uh, to, to kind of have a broader view and more of a package view. Um, also for research. So I think that's uh, where I'm going to stop. But I heard the question also from Filippo regarding the investment entities. Um, I might have a, uh, I, I do, I'm not aware of any research addressing that particular question, and, but uh, it would seem to me that uh, uh, if it's unclear how to define, if you have a portfolio, which is the idea of an investment entity, you have a portfolio of investments. If it's unclear in the standard how to define what is an investment and what is not, I mean, the, 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 uh, the sub, the unit that you are to apply fair value measurement to, uh, that sounds like something that uh, should perhaps then be, be clarified, but uh, um, I'm not relevant, I'm not aware of any, of any research um, addressing that particular issue. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you.
So apologies, I just got thrown out of Zoom for reasons uh, unclear to me and I just got back in right now. So thank you, Niklas. And I think I'm just in time for um, opening for Q&A. Unfortunately, all of my chat has of course now been deleted. I do remember there was one question before I got thrown out of the meeting. And that I think was by Monomita Nandi. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question, Monomita? Hi, everyone. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. My question was, do we need to make it very clear that what are the differences between IFRS 3 and IFRS 10? Because when I talk to people working on IFRS 10, they are quite confused about the valuation aspect. And I think that was one of the limitations in um, the when it was previously revised. So is there any uh, suggestion that how we can deal with this issue? So I'm looking into, into the group of ISB representatives. Um, would would uh, one of you like to take this question or do we need to clarify it? Well, IFRS 3 and IFRS 10 apply, I would say, in, in different moments. IFRS 3 applies when an entity first obtains control of an MVC. Uh, we have uh, a post-implementation review of IFRS 3 that has resulted in some changes and uh, it's also resulted in the publication of a discussion paper. Uh, there have been some discussion about uh, how to apply fair values to certain intangibles. I'm not sure if the question was about that specific aspect. Yeah, yeah the intangible issues, yeah. Well, I think I, I'm not completely, well, I'm not 100% following the, 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 that project on, on, on post-implementation review of IFRS 3. I know that discussion paper has some part where they discuss the need to uh, Farther separate intangibles or less separation of intangibles from goodwill. But I would say this is a different project, although clearly there are some uh, interaction between IFRS 3 and IFRS 10, and necessarily so because the notion of control applies in both cases. Yeah, thank you, Filippo. Um, Thorsten, I'll, I'll add if I may. Um, one of the things we are not doing in the PIR of 10, 11, and 12 is is revisiting the acquisition method. So that sits over in IFRS 3 and we aren't opening that up. So we specifically want to focus in, as Filippo says, yes, on the issue of control, which can be relevant in IFRS 3. It's the issue of control as it is in IFRS 10. And we want to talk about um, equity method. Um, we want to talk about uh, joint ventures and associates. Uh, so we're looking at those sides of it. Um, we aren't addressing the IFRS 3 issues that are about how we do the acquisition method. To answer the question about intangibles, we have some material in the Goodwill DP that refers to some of the discussions that the board has been doing about the separate identification of intangibles. Um, so we are interested in people's feedback on that topic. And we are expecting people to also talk to us about intangibles in the agenda consultation. Because I know for many people, the issue of recognition of intangibles, measurement of intangibles, internally generated and so forth is of great interest. Thanks, Thorsten. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. Maybe I can uh, add a question of mine. And it was prompted a little bit by what Nicholas was uh, was what Niklas was relating uh, about some of the research findings. And this is a question that keeps coming up for me whenever um, uh, I interact with, with standard setters. So a lot of us really are interested in um, conducting empirical impact assessments, effects analysis of standards. Um, and sometimes it seems to be a bit difficult for researchers to know exactly what are intended outcomes and what might be unintended outcomes of a standard. Um, here in this case, for example, the paper by Gluzova that uh, Anna Simpson mentioned, uh, you know, documents changes in the consolidation range in the number of consolidated entities. Other papers look at 
uh, changes in the number of certain types of consolidated entities with certain characteristics. So I'm interested in, in understanding better and also you know, in, in order to provide more, more meaningful and more relevant evidence did the ISB, when it when it first introduced the standard, did it expect to see an increase in the number of consolidated entities or of some kinds of consolidated entities, or perhaps um, was one of the underlying goals of the standard even to discourage the use of you know certain special purpose vehicles for certain activities, perhaps you know vehicles controlled by other than the majority of voting rights. So that was there. So would something be relevant that, um, or would something be an intended consequence that shows that certain types of activities were, were um, being discouraged by the standard? Something like, um, uh, something like uh, securitizations, for example. Anna, you want to say something, or shall I? No, start no. Up? I actually, I actually don't want to. I don't want to say anything. I think with special purpose uh, vehicles, the intention was to get the disclosure that was missing, mm. um, and get those incorporated where they needed to be. So more mm. disclosure, and also more included where appropriate, where there was control. So I think that was very clearly an intention of the standard to address the issue that had, was shown up to be a great weakness at the time of the financial crisis in relation to special purpose entities. But um, I don't feel that I can comment on the other things. So if, if Filippo has any comments, I'll hand to him. Uh, no, I'll just add something. I don't think at the time there was an expectation that IFRS 10 should result in more or less consideration, consolidation. So let me, I mean, it may seem a little bit of a cop-out when I say we wanted the, the standard to result in the right consolidation, mm -hmm. not necessarily more, not necessarily less, because uh, uh, you may incentive, there, there may be incentive to avoid consolidation, but there, was, there could also be incentive to consolidate things that you don't really control because, well, for instance, an entity could say, well, this way it could recognize more profits. So again, uh, there was no specific intent to increase or decrease the number, but really to have uh, an assessment that would be uh, less based on mechanics or quantitative threshold and more really looking at general relationship between the investor and the investee. So what are your rights? Can you really influence the way the investee is operating? Do you really have the power? Do you really have the exposure to the variable returns or not? So again, I understand that it, it, it would make things easier if you could measure these things and say, okay, we expect 10% more and we're getting 10% more is working, but unfortunately that was not objective. Thank you, Philippe. I'm, I'm asking because sometimes or oftentimes actually in empirical papers you that, that look at standard setting issues, you see terms like uh, an unintended consequence or an unexpected effect. And that's not always clear to me what actually, or that we actually have a basis for claiming a certain effect was unexpected or unintended. That, that's really the background. Of my question. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point, Thorsten. There's a couple of places where researchers can look. One is the effects analysis that accompanies the standards, and the other is the basis of conclusions. So that's the place to go where the board does express an opinion that we are, we're doing this for this reason or we're, you know, some discussion. That may help, but I think your point is that sometimes uh, th things are going on. I mean, standards have consequences, and it isn't always clear what the unexpected versus the expected work. Right. So I think it's a good point. Right. And I think it's it's really Thank you. what you're saying is really important for, for researchers who do want to speak to a certain standard setting project, that they really pay attention to what the ISB explicates as uh, intended consequence and really tries to find empirical measures that speak to those intended consequences uh, as best as possible and not simply look at what's available out there in terms of data and then Look at outcomes that you know nobody might really uh, have have even considered, or that don't really speak to yeah. what the standards intention was. Mm. Okay. Um, one example that will come up later because we're going to look at IFRS 12 today as well. You know, it's quite explicit where the board says um, 
there, you do use the equity method, you don't use proportional consolidation, and there will be disclosures that will allow you to have the information that you should have had under proportional consolidation. Yeah. So that is an explicit statement of an expectation and that can be investigated. And yeah. indeed, some people have looked at that. Thank you. Yeah, and compliance was um, less than perfect, I, I recall. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I don't currently see any more questions in the chat, but please feel free to raise them directly if you want to, um, because we have a couple more minutes. If there is nothing else for now, I would like to, you know, waiting a few seconds here, giving you a chance. Otherwise, we could then move on to the next part, where Jen Zhu will uh, will be uh, introducing IFRS 11 and the request for information on that standard. Thank you, Sasan. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. My name is Zhen Xu, uh, a member of a technical staff in RSB. And now let's move on to RFS 11, which deals with joint arrangements, that is either joint operation or joint ventures. RFS 11 requires an investor to, to determine whether a joint arrangement is a joint venture or a joint operation by assessing the rights and the obligation of the parties to the arrangement. The accounting for joint operations and joint ventures are obviously different. Joint ventures is required to account for its interest in joint venture, applying the equity method and reflect interest in a single line item on the statement of financial position, as well as the statement of financial performance. And in contrast, joint operators are required to, to recognize share of asset liabilities, revenue and expenses of a joint operation. When a, joint uh, when a joint arrangement is not structured through a separate vehicle, the classification is, is relatively straightforward as shown on the left-hand side of the decision tree on the slide. But it is, if it, a joint arrangement is structured through a separate vehicle, additional analysis needs to be performed to see if the legal form or the contractual arrangement can actually uh, take precedence. When the contract terms does not, the contract terms do not specify that the parties have rights to the assets and obligations to the liabilities, an entity considers so-called other facts and circumstances as specified in RFS 11. Um, a typical example of a joint operation classification is when parties of the joint arrangement are committed to buying all the, the outputs of the joint arrangements. And some stakeholders uh, uh, said classifying joint arrangements can require significant judgments in some circumstances, which they believe can be burdensome. Um, in the view of these stakeholders, this requirement in RFS 11 could be, uh, regarding the classification of joint arrangement, could be simpler to apply. The second topic that we want to discuss in this meeting is, is about collaborative arrangements that is outside the scope of RFS 11. Some stakeholders noted that there are types of collaborative arrangement in which two or more parties uh, manage activities together, but do not qualify as a joint arrangement as defined in, in IFRS 11. These arrangements fall outside the scope of IFRS 11 because lack of a joint control as defined by the standard. As you can see on the slide, the example in the left-hand side, um, four parties, form an arrangement when each of them holds 25% of the ownership interest. According to the agreement between these parties, a majority of the voting rights is required when directing the relevant activity of this arrangement. That means a different combination of parties such as A, B, and C, or B, C, and D could be able to decide the relevant activity of this arrangement collect collectively. And this is, Unfortunately, not the joint control as defined in RFS 11, which requires a single combination of parties to act unanimously on relevant activities. So some stakeholders told us that uh, an, an analogy to joint operation accounting is made to this collaborative arrangement outside the scope of RFS 11. That is to recognize the share of assets, liabilities, revenue expenses of the arrangement. But we also heard another view that 
um, a party simply applies the, the, the equity method in IS-28 because the party is able to uh, exercise significant influence over the arrangements through their shareholding. Um, many stakeholders asked us to develop requirements for these types of arrangement to avoid um, potential diversity uh, in the practice. So in this area, our question would be if there is any evidence or research on the use of arrangement in which two or more parties actually manage activities together, but outside the scope of, of R511. Now I will hand over to Anna for our uh, academic literature review on the, this standard. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, uh, Jen. So um, if we can move to next slide, thank you. Uh, let me just clarify about the academic literature review since um, Nicholas mentioned earlier, we did uh, an academic literature review when the request for information was uh, first considered by the board, but uh, we are looking to, to find uh, new evidence because we'll be bringing uh, more academic evidence to the board. So uh, if, you, if, you send, uh, if you're working uh, on something and send us something that will be, uh, that will inform the post implementation review. And um, what I have here on this slide is uh, only uh, part of the wider literature. And um, I don't want to offend people who have worked uh, on uh, the equity versus the proportionate consolidation method, uh, this kind of uh, studies, they're not included here. We've tried to um, only um, focus on, uh, on the evidence that is from, um, uh, that relates directly to IFRS 11, or it's from an IFRS uh, reporting jurisdiction. So um, what is the evidence? Uh, there is some evidence from um, the uh, before IFRS 11 um, that relates to IES 31, when there was uh, an option uh, between the equity method and proportionate consolidation. So um, uh, there is, um, uh, some evidence that the equity method uh, was uh, more informative and also um, that uh, analyst information environment is not affected uh, by either of the methods. Um, so in, in that particular study, the, the authors uh, looked at uh, whether um, at uh, companies, some companies using the proportion consolidation and others using the um, <coughs> the equity method and uh, did not find any differences in, in uh, analysts uh, um, forecast errors or dispersion and so on. And, and the authors uh, actually concluded that uh, the uh, removal of uh, this option by IFRS 11, um, uh, this evidence was in support um, of the change brought by IFRS 11. Um, and, um, what is the evidence that uh, looks at actual data by companies reported uh, applying IFRS 11? Um, there is some evidence from um, uh, an exploratory study, and that's uh, the study I mentioned earlier that looks at uh, the effects of IFRS 10 and 11 jointly. And um, they, uh, uh, they look at um, the restatements of companies and also companies' disclosures of what they think the effects of the application of IFRS 11 are, and, and they show that uh, there were significant, um, significant uh, effects uh, on uh, the financial statements, again, looking at uh, assets, equity, uh, and, and other elements. And uh, perhaps the one study that is uh, most really uh, relevant, uh, an empirical study on IFRS 11, um, looks at uh, a large um, multi-country sample. I think they had 26 countries uh, by Sar Sarquis et al. And they, um, they're uh, estimating, examining whether the comparability of financial statements was uh, affected uh, after the um, uh, after applying uh, companies applying IFRS 11, and uh, they adopt uh, the approach. Uh, they 
um, estimate comparability by mapping uh, accounting amounts into economic outputs such as prices, returns, uh, cash flows. So they um, again find uh, evidence which is um, does not necessarily go into one direction. They they split their sample into clusters depending on whether these countries um, applied. Um, the proportionate consolidation more than uh, the equity method and they show that uh, the comparability increased uh, for some of those clusters of countries whereas it decreased uh, for others of course there are some um, um, observations that could be made uh, whether the uh, this method of comparability can be applied uh, to used to estimate the effect of uh, just one standard but um, the, these are um, it, it's not uh, it's not the focus of this discussion today um, I just wanted to to make a brief uh, overview of the academic literature that that relates to IFRS reporting jurisdictions and um, I'm looking forward to to Nicholas's uh, academic uh, commentary a bit later on thank you I'll hand over to Robert. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, regarding what uh, EFRAC has already heard on IFRS 11, on application of IFRS 11, uh, I, I think it's, it's a very interesting uh, issue uh, concerning proportional consolidation. I've often heard that uh, uh, it's it's uh, past, but uh, we still find some evidence that uh, companies in management reports or director's report they still use some elements of proportional consolidation. So, uh, it, uh, of course, we need more uh, insights. We we need to uh, to make more uh, analysis on that, desktop analysis on that. Uh, but uh, uh, this keeps to be, I say, reiterated, uh, repeated. Uh, this also was repeated, this uh, also was raised by some of the users that uh, mentioned that uh, proportional consolidation would, would reduce the, uh, uh, the level of forecasting errors for analysis, uh, which seems to be, uh, seems to be crucial. Uh, on uh, collaborative arrangements, I think everything has been said. Uh, we keep uh, uh, hearing the, the comments that uh, uh, IFRS 11 does not uh, uh, include into its scope some of the arrangements which are similar uh, to uh, collaborative uh, arrangements. However, uh, arrangements that do not satisfy the strict criteria to be included at joint arrangements. So uh, there is no joint control. It could be, say, majority control or majority decision making. Etc. Uh, so uh, we have heard that there are uh, such uh, such uh, such uh, arrangements that uh, would uh, clearly fit in uh, in the idea of uh, accounting for the assets uh, and uh, and liabilities as uh, joint arrangements, similarly to joint arrangements. And uh, finally, uh, it's also a, a request that uh, it's it's being repeated. Uh, uh, in, in European jurisdiction uh, uh, regarding uh, how to account for joint operations in separate financial statements. It's, uh, it's kept being repeated that uh, since we uh, account for uh, subsidiaries, since we account for uh, associates in a different way, why to account for a corporate wrapper, uh, which actually is a joint operation in a different way? Why to account for assets and liabilities? Why, why not to account uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, investment costs. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, that are three are uh, uh, most commonly heard uh, comments about uh, IFRS uh, 11 by by EFRA. Thank you. Great, Robert. Thank you. So let me now hand over to Niklas for some academic insights. And please, everybody, get ready to have your questions available when uh, we get to the Q and A. Niklas, please. Sorry, it was a little bit hard to unmute, but now I think I'm un unmuted. Okay, 
Uh, so I'm going to start uh, just to, to remind ourselves uh, about uh, the equity method and the proportional consolidation method, because it is uh, part of, the, uh, of what I want to discuss. Um, and I often use an example uh, from my country, Ericsson, you know that company, I'm sure. Uh, the company Ericsson in the telecom uh, business, uh, currently working on the 5G, the 5G area. Uh, and a number of years ago, they had a joint venture with Sony, the Japanese company. Uh, and they, uh, the joint venture was named Sony Ericsson. Uh, and in those days, uh, you could uh, then choose uh, between uh, the two methods here, uh, if you wanted to use the equity method or the proportional consolidation method. And as an analyst, of course, if you, you, you might be interested in, in, in looking at both methods here. And the, the numbers provided in the annual report makes it possible uh, to do that because Sony Ericsson's um, um, statements are, are, are public. So as you can see here from Ericsson's uh, consolidated financial statements, uh, they have classified Sony Ericsson, the joint venture, as, um, uh, as used, the method they are using is the equity method. And uh, what uh, I then do in, in class, uh, actually both with analysts uh, who wants to become certified analysts, uh, but also with uh, master students, looking into comparing the two methods here. For Ericsson, you can see using the equity method, you have the left column. If you instead would uh, change to the proportionate consolidation method, you would have the column to the right. And what are the differences? Well. If you do the proportional consolidation method, you would, of course, include 50% of Sony Ericsson's uh, sales uh, and all the other items throughout the income statement. Then if you move from the equity method to the proportional consolidation method, you would have to take out the profit share according to the equity method. And then you see that Sony Ericsson this year, 50% of that profit was 405 million. So taking out that uh, 405 million when moving from equity method to the proportional consolidation method. Then you can see that uh, the proportional consolidation method here has a higher operating income than uh, the profit share from uh, Sony Ericsson. And that is because uh, the, the equity method is looking at the a one line consolidation where you take the net income and 50% of net income, whereas the proportionate consolidation method will take 50% here, or it would be, the impact would be 50% of the operating profit, not including financial items and tax. So there is a difference there. And this difference also then shows, uh, but more importantly here, when we look at the profit margin and the, and the asset turnover and the and return on assets in the kind of a DuPont relation here, we can see that this will be higher for the equity method compared to the proportional consolidation method. Because uh, when you use the equity method, you, you distort the margin, you include the profit, but not the sales. And you actually also uh, distort the asset turnover uh, because uh, you don't have the sales uh, from uh, uh, the joint, joint owned company included. So you get a, a higher profit margin and, and a lower asset turnover if it's a profit-making uh, uh, company that you're owning. And okay, so what's my point here is that uh, both of these methods represent a real challenge to analysts. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there was uh, Robert mentioned here the, the problems of making forecasts. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, this goes even further than that. This is a real challenge. If you think about applying the discounted cash flow method, you want to make sure that you are looking at free cash flows that are under the company's control, right? That you that that uh, and and that is that becomes very problematic here to know uh, exactly what those cash flows are. So that there is an underlying. Uh, problem here for analysts and investors that is very, very hard uh, to deal with. So having said that, if we look at some of the, of the research, and um, Anna has already uh, pointed at some 
and, and, and papers. Uh, we have the paper by Sarki et al, uh, looking at financial statement comparability. And just as you said, Anna, uh, for some of these clusters, uh, there is an increase in the comparability after IFRS adoption. But in some of the other clusters here, there is a decrease. And then uh, there are uh, some uh, where uh, there is not a big, big effect. Uh, and uh, of course, one might think about that. Then, uh, why is that? Why do we see these international differences? Because the, say, the clusters here concern countries. Uh, well, of course, it, it might be because uh, there are differences in how the preparers, how the companies are um, applying IFRS 11. And remember then, as I said earlier here, remember it's a package, right? So now it's so uh, we must be careful not only to think about this within the context of IFRS 11 per se, uh, because um, um, th there are other things changing at the same time. Uh, so this might be the differences here internationally because the preparers interpret IFRS 11 differently, but it might also be that the users, the analysts and the investors make use uh, of the numbers differently here. Uh, maybe some of them are um, changing from one method to the other here using the notes information, as I was doing uh, here for Sony Ericsson, uh, or have, have different approaches when it comes to dealing with these uh, uh, investments in, in uh, joint arrangements. Uh, but it is very challenging. Uh, then we can see in the, in the paper from Minchosti et al. here that uh, they suggest that the analyst information environment is not affected. I think that was a Spanish uh, sample, if I remember correctly. Uh, so that in a particular environment, there is not an indication of a change in the information environment. Uh, but it, that doesn't mean this is not a big challenge for the analysts. Uh, there is a, uh, a quite new paper. I'm not sure it was in the academic literature review here by Gabana et al. Uh, 2020, uh, who looked into uh, uh, a sample of French and Italian companies uh, and uh, the adoption of IFRS 11. Um, and uh, one of their conclusions here, when they're looking at the, the, the uh, the cases where the company had required, where they were required to change to the equity method, uh, they observed a decrease uh, in the value relevance of, of liabilities and to some extent also of, of assets. Um, and so that, that's also a, a question then forcing the equity method here uh, on, on, uh, on uh, a company then there is an indication that that might, might have, have this uh, negative effect. So um, the research results are inconclusive uh, and, and uh, I, I think, the, I, I don't know of course, but uh, I, I think what, what I would like to do if I had uh, uh, time to do research um, here in this area. Now, I, I think uh, one area I would like to dig into here, where I know that's one area I'd like to dig into is that it is this very challenging to incorporate the joint arrangements in BCF models. And, and I think we would need to understand better how this is done in order to also understand what they need to get out from the, from the financial reporting, so to speak. Um, and to what extent they are using uh, the notes here uh, also. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that, uh, that is one, one important thing and, and that we don't, at least not to my knowledge, we don't know. And then I want to repeat what I said already for IFRS 10. I think there is good reason uh, when you look at firms and the effects of, of IFRS 10 or IFRS 11 here, uh, I think it's better to look at this as a package to think about, okay, so if it's not uh, classified as, as, uh, uh, as one thing here, but something else, we cannot just look at one side of the coin, so to speak. We must look at both and, uh, 
uh, sides here uh, to look at the, the effects of the package uh, on a firm by firm basis rather than each of the standards uh, per se, so to speak. And I think also we should include IS 31 there, even though that has um, then remained, that, that is uh, also one place where, where the classification can go, so to speak. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. This was a, a whole range of, I think, very relevant observations, not only for this project, but but you know for the usefulness of research to uh, standard setting overall and vice versa. Um, so let's open up for questions. Again, all of you in the call, please feel free to post your comments and questions into the chat because after all, this is not one of the, uh, not only one of the ISBs and FRAGs um, famous uh, education sessions, but also the reciprocal exercise um, where we wanna learn from each other. Maybe while you're still mulling over this, um, I can maybe make a, uh, an observation and also uh, phrase a question. You know, when we, when we uh, research, when us researchers, when we um, look at standard setting and um, when we try to contribute to standard setting, um, and I mentioned this already in, in the previous section, uh, it, it is sometimes not entirely clear what kind of studies are most useful and uh, what kind of outcomes are most relevant. Maybe one question that, that comes out of this is, when uh, Anna, for example, mentioned uh, uh, the study that uh, Niklas also related to um, that um, looks at the comparability effects. She said this was um, a relatively new notion and uh, empirical measure of comparability. I still remember when the first paper came out, De Franco et al. that kind of invented this comparability measure and it was lauded as a great breakthrough in academic circles. I'm interested in how do you in the standard setting world think about these empirical constructs that we sometimes use to measure certain concepts? So this notion of comparability, for example, this mapping of underlying economics into accounting numbers uh, and, and using that as a, as a gauge, as a, as a measure to speak about um, the extent to which a standard reaches its goals. Um, well, how, do you, how do you think about this? Um, I'll start, Thorsten. Uh, so it is really exciting when we can have techniques that can do large scale studies mm -hmm. because IFRS standards being used in so many countries. Mm -hmm. It's great when people can take a large database and do things with it. And that, of course, is the advantage of something like the DeFranco approach because um, of the ability to do it with a database in comparison to what Sarkos did where they were hand collecting and hand collecting the data on proportionate consolidation. Um, so I think the thing that the um, researchers have to think about, because it, after DeFranco, um, Mary Barth had a paper where she looked at mapping and the mapping was looking at US GAAP and yes. then IFRS. And, and, and that was again within the DeFranco approach, which is accounting systems. Yes. And then what people have done and, and Sarkis is one of these, their, their team is one of these people. They start looking at individual standards. And then that's where you've got to be very careful because it becomes much more difficult to talk about that overall mapping mm -hmm. of um, information into price mm -hmm. when it's on one standard yeah. or three standards. Even so a package I, is bigger than this one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I totally understand why we why we want to do it, but then you just have to think about your design. Um, and in the Sarkis paper, they they did lots of things to try and um, uh, uh, recognize the limitation of what they were doing, and then control in different ways. So I just encourage researchers. You know, yes, it's great, and and we're all keen to be able to model, and and it's from our perspective, which is what you're asking me from the ISB perspective, it is really useful to have things that we've got big data sets in there. Um, so just think about how, how don't, don't be afraid to recognize the limitations of the modeling. Um, nevertheless, on the other hand, if you can, if you can get to conclusions that, that you think 
speak to one of the questions that the IASB is addressing, that, that's really helpful. Mm. I know sometimes uh, academics have got to talk about all the, all the subtleties and, and that's perfectly uh, desirable that, that all that is explained. But once you're taking it outside the academic world and you want practitioners to look at it, just try and present it as, as clearly as you can. Thank you, Anne. Thanks. Um, and we now have something in the chat and uh, this, this really relates to um, another overarching theme that um, comes up again here this perennial challenge that we all face, understanding better what users actually do and what they need and analysts' information needs and analysts' information usage. And here's a, here's a question from Hao Jie Song. Uh, she says her microphone is broken, so she's writing the question. It seems that we focus more on shareholders when talking about the effects of, of standards. Is there any evidence on other users of financial statements? For example, what are the effects of IFRS 11 on lenders? Are they significant? Are they minor? Um, and of course, uh, she realizes that lenders might have their own inside information sources, might not rely as heavily as uh, some public market uh, shareholders on, on published financial statements. Well, Stan, I'll start and the others may want to join in. So it is true that we spend a lot of time thinking about what we call the users of the financial statements. And so this could be um, investors and uh, analysts, um, but also within that group, we do we do talk to credit analysts because all analysts are not the same. They have very varied needs of information. So we do specifically have contact with credit analysts. So they are people that uh, they have a different different information they're looking for. We know that, and and different ways of analysing the information. So you're right when you think about lenders in general as as entities that can access the information they need directly from companies. But we do we do talk about um, credit investors. Um, so I'll stop there. I don't know if mm -hmm. Philippa or Jen has anything they want to add. Uh, yes, we, we did hear, uh, yeah. uh, Yes, we did you hear guys. some from uh, the investors and credit analysts uh, about about uh, specifically for this, for, for example, a joint venture and associates. And generally they welcome, because, because sometimes it's, it's difficult to tell whether it's a compliance problem or a disclosure, or it's, it's mm -hmm. just a lack of guidance or lack of requirements to disclose specific information. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, so we, we, when we present uh, what we call a, a fine, a, a good example of disclosure, basically they welcome the, uh, they, they said it's sufficient and useful. That is uh, general information, general feedback we heard from the users. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and um, Niklas, you're probably not, mm -hmm. go ahead. And please. No, you go, you go. No, I, you was go. Gonna, I was gonna uh, put this to, to Niklas and, and ask if he's aware of any papers that look specifically at debt market related outcomes, uh, but not sure he probably would have brought them up, right? Uh, yeah, yes, I would. I, I noted that Robert had a, a comment there. I think it was about covenants, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it's a very good question, of course, when it comes to, uh, it's not only analysts and investors, uh, mm -hmm. so it's true. I, I was, uh, uh, and I think also the papers have been focusing a lot of, of, on analysts and, and uh, also um, value relevance, uh, but uh, uh, it's, of course, uh, also as the the person in the chat is, is, is asking here, what about the fulfillment of debt covenants here? Mm -hmm. And again, what, what cash flows from a joint arrangement is really available for paying back your debt? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that uh, debt holders are thinking and credit analysts are, are thinking carefully about that. And, and that, that is a challenge. Uh, so uh, I was wondering, Anne or uh, or Philippe, if you if you've talked or anyone else from the ISB or or Efrag, if you've talked to to uh, the lenders here, uh, have they expressed any view on on how they what they think about the, the the current accounting for joint arrangements in that particular perspective, when it, it comes to setting uh, debt covenants and when it comes to evaluating what cash flows that are available for for paying back debt. 
-hmm. If I can make a comment, I mean, your point about uh, availability of cash flow is something that we have heard uh, a number of times because, of course, there are a lot of interest about the disclosure on uh, any kind of constraints about uh, uh, cash moving within the group. So uh, I don't remember specific comments on the lender's perspective, but certainly uh, encouragement to ensure that our requirements require full disclosure of uh, any kind of constraint uh, on distribution of cash uh, and availability of cash uh, at a different level of the group. So that's something that we've heard a number of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that of course is the, the at the heart of uh, of decision usefulness, right? This notion of future cash flows to stakeholders, including, of course, the lenders. I think, in, unless Anne, you wanna you wanna pitch in, I I would yeah add to that then. Yeah, I've got just mm -hmm. Please. one one more thing I'd like to bring up if if uh, I could. Um, so the team in looking at um, IFRS eleven, so. Today, um, Nicholas and Robert have both mentioned, well, Nicholas pointing to uncertain information under both proportionate consolidation and equity method, and Robert mentioning that some stakeholders have been speaking to them about proportionate consolidation. Um, one of the things that the team have been looking at is disclosures uh, around um, information where people could reconstruct proportionate consolidation. Um, specifically in segment notes. So if I just ask out there if anybody has been looking uh, in terms of particularly segment information, they might have been looking in that in relation to segments, in relation to primary financial statements, and or they may have been in relation to equity method and proportionate consolidation, because we understand that some entities are putting disclosures into their segment notes uh, that would be as if proportionate consolidation. So if anyone's got that kind of information, particularly descriptive statistics, if you could let us know um, with, via Anna's email, uh, we'd, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. So even if I just said uh, we need to move to the next topic, there is a, a, nice, um, a nice post in the chat. And Paul, I, uh, I, you, you're basically writing what I was thinking as well. Uh, and this came up a little bit before as well. Why not give a more broad we think to everything, of course, you can't do it all. But uh, Paul, would you like to uh, phrase your question? Thanks. Yeah, no, it's just uh, why not have a, a greater rethink? And, and uh, the, the disclosure project is, is generating a rethink about maybe trying to classify differently some integrated, non integrated types of JVs. The, the equity method is something that we sort of adopted as you know, the, the only sort of option more or less to converge with the Americans at the time. Uh, this is not an overriding sort of objective anymore. We know all the problems we have with the equity method. It is an off balance sheet type method. I mean, it, it hides debt that's sitting potentially in, in, in these uh, JVs that we don't always know very much about. It generates a lot of issues, Niklas has pointed out with respect to understanding the impact on cash flow. So I'm just wondering why we're not rethinking a little bit more what to, and how to actually account for these things. Um, Paul, thanks for your comments. They're as always excellent. You know that we've got an equity method project on where we've started small. We're trying to look at IAS 28 and see to what extent we can get IAS 28 to answer these big questions about equity accounting. Um, so we are working on that, um, but uh, I think it's really germane if you could put those kind of comments you just made via a comment letter into the into the consultation process because the staff are very careful about considering everything that they receive. To answer your question, why we don't do these bigger rethinks? Because it would seem bigger rethinks are needed on quite a few things. Um, it, it's a lot to do with the. Um, checks and balances or the pressures, the pulls and pushes within the standard setting system. You know, the, the um, push to get solutions and answers in a timely way um, and the resistance to have major rethinks. There's a lot of people out there that just want business as usual. They don't actually want us to fundamentally change. And, and as when, when you've been around the business 
a long time, as some of us have, and you look what's gone on, you can identify where something seemed to change for reasons like convergence rather than a sound theoretical reason for the change. And therefore, it, it, once they're ingrained and in operation, it's hard to unpick those. Not impossible, but hard. So we do need encouragement for the big, the big thinking. Thanks, Anne. I'll stop there. Thank you. So th this is an encouragement for the Financial Reporting Standards Committee to tackle this, uh, this project in the comment letter. And Paul, you're invited to join. <laughs> okay, so let's um, move on to the third topic, which is no less interesting. This is about IFRS 12 and the disclosures related to uh, all of these interests in other entities. Uh, Jen, would you like to introduce, please? Thank you, Sasha. Uh, in the first phase of our project, we received a limited feedback on disclosure requirement in IFRS 12. And uh, some stakeholders asked for additional information to be disclosed and other stakeholders found some of the requirements excessive. Um, actually, in the recent outreach activities we conducted with investors, we've heard some positive feedback that useful and sufficient information is disclosed by entities. However, we also learned from our stakeholders that insufficiency of information related interest in other entities in some situations due to lack of compliance, as I said, or boilerplate disclosure. For example, some investors said disclosure related to the significant judgment or assumptions made when determining control, drawing control, significant influence, sometimes does not provide useful information uh, for investors and to understand the relationship between an investor and its investee. And in this area, we would like to ask if there is any additional research or evidence on the effects of these disclosure requirements in RFS 12, either on cost of capital or value relevance. And uh, slides, so the uh, next few slides are about disclosure on joint ventures and associates. IFRS 12 requires summarized financial information of each individually material joint ventures and associates to be disclosed separately. And uh, uh, next two slides give you an example of the disclosure of individually material joint ventures and associates here. Some of the financial performance measures, some of the financial position measures here. Also, there is a reconciliation from the net assets of these associates and joint ventures to the carrying amount of the investment on the balance sheet of the investor. And uh, the next slide, uh, this is for individually immaterial joint venture and associates. So basically disclosure on, in this area is, is only required on aggregated basis. Uh, as shown on this slide, basically uh, much simpler than the individually material ones. And uh, additionally, as mentioned by Anne, we also notice a type of situation in which a company, when making its segment disclosure, includes share of revenue or, or other particular kind of assets or liabilities of its joint venture and associates to come up with, for, for example, in this example, come up with a, a combined revenue, which is of course bigger than the consolidated revenue, consolidated sales on the uh, statement for financial performance. And we understand that, of course, these associates the joint ventures are accounted for using the equity method. And uh, the IFRS 8 the segment disclosure requirements also requires a segment inf so information to be disclosed based on the uh, the way they manage its, its business by the CODM. Uh, so this is, we, we can call sort of voluntary disclosure, this kind of thing. So again, we would like to ask uh, if there is evidence in this area, I mean, the disclosure of joint venture and associates, and as, a, as well as these related information in the segmental information, uh, do you have any other research or evidence available for us to, 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 to look at. Um, I will hand over to Anna for a summary of the literature review on this area. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Um, 
Well, there isn't much literature uh, here on uh, IFRS 12. There are a couple of studies that uh, we have come across. One is based on a, a single country, the Czech Republic, and um, they, they do a review of uh, uh, different categories of uh, disclosure and uh, they reach the same conclusion as uh, the other study, uh, which we mentioned already, Sarquis et al. Uh, they, they hand collect information on IFRS 12 disclosures and both studies uh, show that uh, the level of uh, compliance is relatively low. In fact, uh, the study by uh, Sarquis et al, they look at whether the, uh, the low compliance is not uh, a matter of uh, companies just getting used to, the, uh, to applying IFRS 12 because they track the first three years of applying the standards and they establish that there hasn't been much uh, difference uh, over these uh, three years. I think they, uh, they show that uh, half of the companies are just uh, less than, uh, slightly less than half of the companies in their um, relatively large sample um, do not comply fully with uh, the disclosure requirements of IFRS 12. So this is, uh, this is in a nutshell, the evidence that's uh, out there. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Robert now. Yes, thank you, Anne. So Robert, please share your observations. Thank you. Uh, what should be said is uh, that uh, we, we heard that IFRS 12 provides uh, useful information. Therefore, there is a huge change uh, compared to, situation to, to the situation before uh, uh, the consolidation pack, uh, package uh, uh, has been implemented. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we also we also heard some uh, uh, worries about uh, implementation, and uh, there is a big group of uh, comments regarding NCI non-controlling interest, and uh, it uh, it also keeps be, uh, keeps being repeated. So uh, there is no uh, information on how. Uh, NCI affects cash flows of, of the group in general. So there are some some uh, some uh, requests maybe to provide uh, information on uh, cash flows, which are related to to NCIs. Maybe other type of uh, of additional information regarding uh, uh, the shareholders that do not control uh, that are not the, uh, the, the group. Uh, of controlling of the of the entity, uh, one of the elements that were the, that uh, that were provided as good good uh, examples, good way forward is a, a proportional EBITDA, a, a bit uh, uh, as a voluntary uh, disclosure at the moment, but it seems that it, it provides some good information on uh, on uh, effect of the non-controlling interest. Uh, information on unconsolidated structure entities. So, uh, nevertheless, yes, uh, IFRS provides more information, and uh, uh, it seems to uh, it, it seems to be uh, we, we received a good uh, comments on application on IFRS 12. Nevertheless, we also heard uh, a request that uh, mm, uh, we need to assess, and it's one of the attracts uh, future studies. Uh, uh, how unconsolidated was uh, information about unconsolidated structure entities uh, uh, now uh, uh, proved to be uh, better when the information provided by entities proved to be better or or maybe there is a, a room for um, improvements and finally uh, a set of uh, disclosures that uh, 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 for example mm, the users receive information on the actual status of the uh, of the investees, so as it's a subsidiary associate joint uh, uh, operation or joint uh, uh, as a jo joint venture. Uh, however, there is lack of information on uh, what actually and uh, what is the weight of uh, actual judgments uh, uh, used to assess uh, that uh, that status of investees. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you, uh, users also requested uh, more information on uh, uh, economic compulsion uh, uh, were, were needed, and the risks and cash flows were requested to be uh, uh, the information about risks and cash flows. 
uh, were uh, requested on a more granular level than uh, it's uh, uh, currently available. And finally, there is a slide uh, 45 uh, uh, where we still uh, uh, receive comments that it's not just the consolidated uh, consolidation package that is interesting, but also uh, uh, how uh, other standards interact with consolidation package. So, for example, recently we've heard about the uh, uh, discussion of the uh, IFRS interpretations committee regarding leases. So. Uh, the interaction of IFRS 16 and IFRS 11, we still hear some comments that uh, the result sometimes uh, may be not useful uh, of, of, of application um, of, of that guidance. Uh, moreover, uh, presenting information by the operators of oil fields uh, uh, under IFRS 16 uh, interact, uh, in interaction with IFRS 11 uh, could be uh, less interesting to users, less informative. And, and finally, uh, recently we heard, uh, and maybe it's, it's, uh, it needs more uh, analysis, uh, interaction with IFRS 5, uh, and uh, uh, namely uh, when an investee uh, falls down and uh, becomes a discontinued operation, users uh, say that the information about uh, these operations uh, are, uh, is, is lost somewhere in uh, this uh, uh, IFRS 5 uh, requ uh, required disclosures and information and that uh, maybe would need to, to be revisited to, to improve such, such information. I think this is, yeah, thank you. This is all from Attract. Fascinating, fascinating detailed feedback you're getting. Niklas, would you share your thoughts on this, please? And slides, probably. Don't forget the mic. Yep. Yes, that was my problem. Now I have solved that problem. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, I, ha I have uh, uh, just uh, one one slide. I should say I, I, uh, I got it wrong earlier on this point. It should be IS 28, of course. It was late last night uh, for my last slide there. Um, so I have only one slide. As Anna said earlier, there hasn't been uh, much research. I, I, what I did preparing for this uh, meeting was uh, I, I made, uh, uh, I looked through some different academic uh, databases and searched for, for IFRS 10, 11, and, and 12 for recent research. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I didn't find uh, much uh, compared to what is um, already in, in, the, in the previous review, uh, some being published now, but 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 not not different projects. Um, I did find one paper that I I don't think it was included, but I, I may be wrong. Uh, and uh, I think this is perhaps what uh, Anne was uh, uh, asking for. I'm not sure, but uh, disclosures on joint ventures uh, in the notes. This uh, paper by Gavano, Gutaldo, Monsello. <clears throat> regarding uh, the, the, the paper in JIAAT from 2020, did the switch uh, to IFRS for 11 for joint ventures affect the value evidence on consolidated financial statements, evidence from France and, and Italy. And in, in that paper, they refer to um, looking into to the notes. Um, so uh, they, they start by saying, since the equity method does not allow the co-venturer's share of joint venture assets and liabilities to be shown on the financial statement of financial position, we investigate whether the value relevance of the disclosure of such amount in the notes increases for companies required to change to the equity method. And we expect the switch to the equity method to increase in the value relevance of the disclosure of co-venturer's share of joint venture assets and liability. This is because market participants will be able to obtain from the notes the information that the equity method keeps off uh, the statement of financial position. And uh, this relates a little bit to, to um, what we discussed earlier. 
Uh, and and uh, thank you, Paul, for your uh, very wise uh, input here uh, on, on these matters. Uh, I didn't dare to be too frank, but uh, there are problems with the equity method, for sure. On the other hand, the alternative is not uh, perfect either, so there is a need for, for rethinking. I agree with you there. Um, then if we look at the, the results here, then what they say, I think this one may have been moving around a little bit, um, the yellow boxes here. But anyway, we do not find any significant increase of the relevance of the disclosure of the co-venturers, share of joint venture uh, assets and liabilities. Our results suggest that investors have a low propensity to consult the information provided in the notes and base their decisions mainly on the amount reported on the face of the financial statements. Um, well, this is something we, we, we recognize that uh, um, it, it's, not, it's not that unusual that even professional users uh, focus a lot on, on what is reported uh, um, on the face uh, of the financial statements rather than the notes. But uh, um, at least this is a paper uh, that is perhaps of, of relevance here. Uh, so uh, that is what I found uh, when going through uh, and, and doing a search just uh, uh, yesterday, actually, uh, trying to find new papers. Uh, so I don't think I have any more to add actually on, on this, this map. Thank you, Nicholas. I think your, your final comment, um, your final comment also shows again that, or your final finding here shows again that markets may not be as efficient as we sometimes like to think and that notes disclosure is not a perfect substitute for recognition um, as a long line of research has also shown again and again. And um, yeah, just having something in the notes is not the same. Um, I don't currently have any questions in the chat. It seems that the participants are equally um, less, let's say, vocal about disclosures and IFRS 12 relative to the two other ones. Maybe if this doesn't change, I can uh, conclude with, with a question that potentially also related to the upcoming workshops. Um, uh, directed at the ISB, perhaps um, the, the kinds of the kinds of research insights that you find most useful, and to what extent would you also be interested in not only not only research studies that uh, look directly at the effects of a certain standard or at the um, you know at IFRS jurisdictions or time periods that speak directly to a project. To what extent would you be interested in findings that might allow conclusions, maybe indirect conclusions being drawn on matters of interest? So, so how broad should we cast our net when we review and bring to the table um, research findings, even if, for example, they don't have IFRS X in the title? Um. Thorsten, tell me a bit more what you're thinking. Um, you know, if it hasn't got IFRS Iphorus X in the title, but presumably yeah. it in some way relates to financial reporting yeah. and financial information. I guess I guess what I mean is is the extent to which you think that studies conducted, for example, in a U.S. environment could could contain insights that you might still find interesting for your purposes, even though they don't. Uh, they don't directly um, assess IFRS standards. So what? Um, well, there can there can be a lot of information from U.S. data from research on U, on U.S. data where the U.S. standards are doing something similar to what IFRS standards are doing. So in the area of financial instruments. So we've started our post implementation review of IFRS nine classification and measurement. Um, we're really looking for data around. Um, uh, the fair value OCI option, uh, fair value PL. Um, there's a lot of uh, talk around around that that, that under IFRS nine, um, invest, investment in equities in only certain circumstances goes to fair value OCI, and there is no recycling. Um, so comparing that to US situation where they don't have that, um, that that's a very interesting area for us. Mm -hmm. A uh, second one that I could think of 
is where people, are, you know, the US are talking about um, a different approach to goodwill and wanting to do um, something different with goodwill. So their private companies are doing um, goodwill amortization. So there could be insights from something like that. Thank you. Um, there's also probably insights from environmental things that that actually speak to financial reporting. So if there if there are things, there are all sorts of things going on that don't have IFRS XX in the title, but can still be can still be relevant. So we're often thinking about the costs of things, and sometimes costs uh, relate to system changes. And so when big standards come, they cause system changes. Mm. So. Could be investigating. Um, the person could be investigating things that are happening internally mm -hmm. to a company that isn't well. In some way, it's related to financial reporting, but it's a bit broader than just thinking about IFRS XX. So I suppose what I'm saying is that there are many ways to think about the standards and the impact of the standards. N not always just thinking about, oh, what did it do to value relevance, or what did it do to the analyst forecasts right. error. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think we should be a bit, bit broader and and look around a little bit more to to bring in what might also be indirectly related or, or broader changes that that might be happening um i think um, yeah, by the way that, make... yeah just just uh, just maybe reacting to what you said about systems changes some people that i've yeah. been speaking to uh think that ifs 16 actually provided a big boost to artificial intelligence applications in accounting um mm -hmm. intended mm -hmm. or unintended mm -hmm. Uh, I yeah. I don't know, but uh, this is clearly something yeah. that we do see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just today, we've released our proposals about disclosure, and this is we're describing as a pilot approach. So the targeted standards level review of disclosure project approach it released today, and this is a, a big project in the sense that it's talking about changing the way we approach disclosure requirements and using more objectives. It's not a new conversation. We had this conversation in a research forum several years ago. You were there, Nicholas Selman was there. Many of our audience today were, was present at that research forum where we were talking about this several years ago. So we've re released the proposals. Now, this is the kind of work that uh, research can be very relevant because it's actually looking at behaviors and looking at incentives. So it's not specifically, although the pilot materials talk about two specific studies a person could be researching around behavior around incentives around governance around audit all sorts of areas that could still be relevant to this project and relevant to us developing our ideas is this viable or not to take a new approach to disclosure these are great closing remarks so i'm not even going to try to add on to that i'm just gonna look one more time to the chat nothing new there i want to thank all of you again for making this session possible all of the presenters all of the participants and the discussants thanks for joining and again consult this new summary page we have to register and sign up for the next workshops uh, there are a few interesting ones coming up crypto assets i think is one of my favorites and then, of course, uh, we're trying to mirror and accommodate the company um, all the interesting projects that the ISB has lined up and EFRA is working on. And we'll uh, keep meeting here and discussing these. All right. And now, have a good weekend. Oh, I actually see uh, our, academic, our academic speaker for the next Crypto Assets Workshop, Benedict. You're also here today, getting testing the waters here a bit, right? And uh, see what the format's like. Good. Looking forward to seeing you next time. All the best and have a good weekend now. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.